Welcome to Reality Coaching for Writers, where we offer the real no stuff bluff. and no bluff. <laughs> so, Diana, what's our question today? Oh, um, I missed you, Eddie, last week. I'll just throw that out there. Okay, so our question today is, how do fiction and nonfiction readers keep, what entices them to keep turn? Can we start this introduction over? No, we're just going to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually a pretty, pretty good way to lead into this. I, I, I read this, I read a book somewhere, kind of like similar to what we're doing here. The, int the introduction was completely bungled and the reader and the narrator were like, can we start over? And then you had a little insert from the editor. No, we're not going to start over. Just keep going. Just roll with it. Roll. With it. And that was the beginning of the book. That was the beginning of the book, right? So right away, you're like, oh, this is going to be funny. This is going to be good. So uh, that, that's part of it. So, yeah, so with the, the, the question is, how do you keep readers turning the pages and keep them interested in what you're, what you're reading? You, you've got all the trouble to write a book and you want them to read the, read the book or at least keep, you know, keep interest. And the same thing applies for film and movies. How do you keep the, the readers and the audience engaged? Um, and you, we've got a list of some of the things that, that um, you know, actually we're going to kind of come to this from the way of <clears throat> things that you want to pull out. You want to withdraw from your final product so that uh, people keep reading the pages. Um, and the first one on our list is one that we've talked about a little bit before. You've got um, you use the word rue, R-U-E, um, we rue the day, and I'll just let you real quickly give a summary of what rue means and why it's important to get rid of the rues. Rue is the urge to explain. You've got to give your reader intelligence that they've lived life enough to know a lot of assumable things as an adult. Yeah, so res resist the urge to explain. So the second one on the list is, you know, this is beginning to sound like the Winnie the Pooh thing. So the first is rude. We got to get rid of rude. Poor rude, you go away. And then the next <laughs> one, we've got, next one we've got is uh, we're going on an info dump. What's an info dump? How do you how do you deal with an info dump? Well, a lot of readers think they have to bring. It's you. Know, speakers we call it fire hosing when somebody just wants to take you know seven master's degree in college and give it in a 30-minute sermon <laughs> so you're fire hosing you're trying to give them everything but then you end up with them not taking away anything so it's not overwhelming your readers at the beginning of a book with a bunch of unnecessary information it should be something they learn as they go. And that's true in fiction and nonfiction. Yeah, I would say that it, 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 one of the reasons you want to keep from doing that is because the mind, our minds can only absorb so much at a certain pace. Now, some people, they can grasp things really quickly and they can grasp a lot of things really quickly, but that's not most of us, you know. So, you, uh, you know, I like to say I write in an eighth grade level because... Uh, I'm just assuming that most of the readers, it's going to take them a while to get, you know, get the process. And so give me, give me as a reader, give me one thing and give me time to digest it. And then give me the second thing, because if you give me three things too fast, I'm just going to go, I don't know what that was. I couldn't even tell you what I just ate, you know, that kind of thing. Right. So that's, so we, so we're kicking out Rue and we're not going to stop and do info dumping along the way. <clears throat> Uh, and part of that, I guess, is tied to number three. You you want to you want to make sure that you respect your reader and give them enough credibility that they know things. They know things. We've got it listed as in, inferring that the reader knows nothing about anything, and we don't want to make that assumption. We want to assume right. they're somewhat intelligent, right? So explain right. that a bit. Well, it it goes along with like screenwriters have um, music to build suspense um, and in, you know, it lets us know, oh no, there's somebody around the corner about to pounce on them. But a writer does not have that advantage. So he has to use his words, he or she, but how do they do that? How do they build that 
Um, and it takes a fine, <laughs> my little house guest is trying to get my attention. So, um, but it takes a fine um, brushstroke. Eddie, you, you might, how about you explain that? How do you um, not insult your reader by giving them just enough to lead them into down the path that yeah, you want my, them to go. Yeah, my, my problem is more the opposite direction because I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to <clears throat> make, make a great assumption that people, my readers do know a lot or at least are able to grasp a lot and, and paint in. Right, them. that's what you want to do, yes. Right. So uh, I'll get accused more often of not having enough paint strokes in there and mm -hmm. people will be confused and lost. Well, I wasn't sure where that was coming from. And, and, and I really don't take offense at that because if I only hear that comment one or two times, then I think I've probably done a pretty good job of not, I've, I've probably done a pretty good job of assuming that my reading audience does grasp it enough and that a few people aren't, but that's okay. I'd rather have a few people not catch it than the majority go, you were boring me, man. I know this stuff. I'm, you know, uh, we know, we know how, for example, a, a vehicle is driven. So that's one of the things that John McDonald teaches or used to teach uh, really well is don't tell somebody how a vehicle gets from point A to point B. We know how vehicles arrive. We know how planes fly. We know how ships work. You don't need to tell the reader that. You just need to let them see it leaving the airport next time they're arriving at the hotel. That's it, right? Don't, the only reason you would have the, chase, the car scene is if it's a chase scene. You're right. You know, if you're going to show a vehicle, anything moving. So... Yeah, that is, that, that's an inferring that the reader's not smart enough to figure out how a car works, right? Uh, unless a, that's part of yeah, the problem. Yeah, I have a question for you related to that. So you're a mystery writer. So you're, you're often trying to mislead your reader, right, with red herrings. Yeah. And so that, again, is a different problem for you as a, a mystery writer. Oh, uh, it's a huge problem, I, you know, I, because I'm in... Yeah, because I, what I've got, what I do is I wind up getting to the end of the story, and if I'm doing it well, I haven't planted enough clues for who the killer is. Mm. I haven't, right? Be, be right? Intentionally, intentionally. So then I have to go back and figure out where I can drop in enough breadcrumbs, um, hopefully in a place that the reader won't pick up on it, uh, obviously. And then when they get to the end, they're surprised that they didn't get the. The name right who the killer was and then they can go yeah but did he did he give me enough clues and then they can go back and go oh yeah he gave me one here and here i should have picked <laughs> up on that right we watched benny and i watched a tv show the other night there were three suspects in this thing um and we got to the end and we had ruled out all three there was a there were three suspects and a victim we ruled out all three hmm. we said there's no way the, the, those three are obvious that's not that can't be it so who is it and, and and if you're a writer you can't have the the, the killer somebody that you never meet that's cheating right right because right? we all have to have a joint chance to solve the mystery right so three suspects diana we ruled out all three there was a victim who was the killer i'll ask you who's the killer that's the victim killed himself it's a suicide exactly. Exactly. <laughs> And we yeah. didn't get, we didn't get it. And I was like, oh man, <laughs> clearly, you know, we knew you got, you got four cards, three of them aren't it. It's got to be, you know, we didn't, we didn't get it. Anyway, that's what you're trying to do. You, you want the reader to have a fair shot at, at, at enjoying the story, but not without too much information. <clears throat> well, so and the, the way this would translate to nonfiction is you don't want to give them all your points in the first chapter. <laughs> right. And, you know, but it leads into one of my favorite workshops that I've taught over and over again is, do you have enough material for a book? Is it a blog or is it supposed to be an article? Because some great ideas can't translate into a book length handling of the topic, at least, what you know about the topic you know the topic might you know with a, a professor who's taught it for 20 years could handle but what you know about the topic might just be a darn good article 
And so the, the thing is, if you put everything you have in the first chapter, chances are uh, you're going to struggle then to have yeah. succeeding chapters that are going to keep the reader interested. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you 100 percent on that on nonfiction. If if you said it all in the first chapter, then the rest of the rest of the book is a repeat of the first chapter. That's all you're getting. And if you if you're not bringing more, new information, the, the first chapter of nonfiction should be the least informative book chapter of the book, the very least, because it's a teaser. That's the right. whole point of the book is you're building to an escalation to so that the last chapter of a nonfiction book is the payoff chapter. All this built to this one thing. This is, I mean, this is what the Bible is all about. This is this is one reason we read it. We get to the end of Revelation and we're going, wow, you know, brand new world, everything's made new. Yay! You know, <laughs> you know, if you put all that in if you have Genesis and then Revelation, and then the rest of the Bible, it'd be a downer. You're going, okay, well, we end with Jude. Well, that's okay. Jude's a good book, but that's really not the climax of the story. So now you've got to build to the escalation of that last chapter. Right. Um, right. In fact, that's probably good advice for nonfiction writers. If if you start with a, a chapter one, like you just described, take that chapter and move it to the end. Make that your, your final chapter. Start with that premise and then right. see what you can do to build to that. That probably right. is. That's like, good. Yeah. So what's oversimplifying the read the, the, the writer's point you've got fluff without offering any solid takeaway what do you mean by that so when a reader picks up the back of a book a, a book off the shelf and reads the back of the book there's a reader promise there and um it holds true for fiction and for nonfiction, but especially for the nonfiction writer the promise is they're going to come away with something some knowledge they didn't have that's going to make their life better, or they're going to learn a skill like we covered building a birdhouse before. And if you fail to deliver on that promise, you're going to have a very uh, upset reader. Uh, they might even return the book to Amazon if it's possible, or they're going to write a review that's very, um, you know, not pleasant. It's not uh, complimentary and they're disgruntled and they will not read your next book for sure. So you've got to follow through on, on that promise, but, but you can't stretch it out like thin soup, you know, just mm -hmm. adding more water. You have to give them something of substance. Um, so that's what we mean by no fluff. Right. And, and I would say if you're, if you're, um, uh, nonfiction, I'm, I'm going to hold off on offering a suggestion for nonfiction because <clears throat> that requires knowledge. So uh, that's not a, that's not as easy a fix for fiction writers. One of the ways, and, and and you would you wind up in this box if you've got a certain word count that you've got to hit. Now, let's say you're under contract and you've got to deliver eighty thousand words or sixty thousand words, and you're only at fifty thousand words, and you're going well that leaves me with fluff and, and you're right the temptation is either to repeat the same thing over and over again you know you're repeating the same problem or the same mac the same angst that the character has she's still you know re reliving the same problem again the third time right the better way to do that is to just uh involve another character more in the story and give them their own that that character more of a character arc right so this is how minor characters in a story steal the show, right? Because you wound up with basically a story that's only 40,000 words. You got to get to 80, right? And that 40,000 is mostly your main character. Uh, if you want to get to 80, you bring in two more characters with their own character arc, and they are really interesting and exotic and characters and eccentric and all that. And they steal the show, perhaps, but at least you get to your 80,000 word count, right? And right. it makes for a really rich story at that point, right? Because of the characters. That's the way you do that. Yeah. And that's that brings in mind the uh, award that, you know, best supporting actor, you know, because the story would not be the same without that added perspective. It's right. it's a nuance. It's a level that, you know, just uh, brings so much more color to the, the whole uh, storyline. Yeah. So. 
I think I was saying also the temptation is to go heavy into description and to strive, describe the color of the paint on the wall or more drapes or more doilies or something. And there is, there's, we talked before how important it is to describe a single object, but you can't bog a reader down. I can't, I can't tell you how many books I get from the library that look promising on the first page, second page even, third page. I'm now reading at least five pages before I check a book out of the library because I have gotten so, I have like the very next day turned around and take, take the book back. And so it looks like I'm reading all these books, but I'm really not <laughs> because they're so disappointing. They, they just are, get mired down in cuteness. And, you know, I mean, to mention there's doilies on the furniture once, but then to continue to mention doilies because you're trying to show the characters old or in the vintage, um, just tell me once, don't need to repeat it 50 times. Right. right. And I'll give, I'll throw this tip out then and we'll move on to the next one. But for, for any writers, if you're going to, if you're in the self-published publishing mindset of you're going to do this yourself, you're going to write your stories and just publish your own fiction or nonfiction, just keep in mind, all those words are, are an expense, right? Yeah. So if you can, if you can trim 5,000 words from your manuscript, yeah, you just put maybe 30 cents more in your pocket every time that book sells. That's the way to look at that, you know, so the, yeah. the, the thinner it is, the tighter that story, the quicker the, the reader is going to get through it and they're going to go, wow, that was good. Give me the next one. And that's exactly. what you want. Exactly. Yes. And I think that, you know, the norm of having a novel be between 70 to 100,000 words like we used to look for all the time, um, it's, it's, we have liberty now to write a really good story with 60,000 words, 40,000 in some cases, you know, like you said, if it's good and they don't want to put it down, if you, you'll have a satisfied reader. Right. So what about loose ends? Uh, so again, this can pertain to the, um, in nonfiction, not delivering on the promise. It's, um, you know, not totally giving them every skill they need for the project that you were telling them they would know how to build or uh, how their life would be richer if they just trusted God more. But you really didn't tell me. You just kept saying, trust him more, trust him more, trust him more. You didn't give me any how to or examples of other people that have and how they, what they, how it played out in their life. So if you leave all these things loose and fiction for me, it is um, having a secondary character that you're rooting for as well. And then nothing ever happening. They just disappear. They, they're there. And then they, you really start to like, like the interaction between the main character and that secondary character. But then all of a sudden they disappear and they're never mentioned again. Not even any remorse on the part of the main character that they're no longer in their life. We don't know if they died, if they, you know, voted the wrong way or why they're out of the person's life, you know. Yeah, they're, they're, and so, yeah, so that's frustrating too. Yeah, so that, and that's an, edit, that's an editing issue. So if you're, because if you're, if you're writing in the, in the creative mindset then we're we're throwing things out there and we're not trying to tie it up at that point we're just introducing we're just basically creating stuff right but at the end of the process the writer and the editor have to go back and tie up these loose ends they do have to just bring these things to to ful fulfillment yeah. um, and if you don't do that you're right the readers are going well, what happened um and yeah and it's and it can be difficult um I'm not, I'm going to go ahead and share this. I, I don't know if it really applies or not, but it was something we did last night at the, uh, at our, at our Bible study. We were going through, I think we're in chapter six of John and, and Jesus makes a couple of interesting comments that people come to him and they're asking him questions about like, when did you get here? Cause he, he fed the 5,000 then he disappeared and then he's there and they catch up with him and they're going, when did you get here? And he doesn't answer the question. He goes off and just makes these kind of obtuse 
remarks about things. Well, one of them is, uh, well, it's kind of a really challenging command. He says, don't work for food. Mm -hmm. Don't work for food. That, so and I, I've never heard any preacher say, here's a command from Jesus. Don't work for food. Okay, well, all right, I'm, I'm, can I work for a shelter? Is that okay? Can I work for some clothing? Is it okay if I work for clothing? I, I'll skip the food. I'll, be, uh, I'll, I'll just shrivel up and go away. But in other words, it's just an odd comment, right? And we understand. Okay. He, he's saying, don't work for food that spoils. Work for food uh, that, that, li that lives on through eternity. That's an eternal food, right? Oh, okay, that sounds good. All right. Well, what does that look like? He never really explains what that looks like. He doesn't explain what what that looks like right so we were bantering that around and i told him i said i don't know that this is a biblical truth but i think i'm probably in the right part i think i'm in the field i may not be in the right part of the, the infield or maybe in the outfield but i think i'm close and i think what jesus is saying is eternal food is people mm. people are the eternal food that we work should work for not for material possessions it's the people it's the individual work for those because when you get to heaven and you see somebody that you met here on earth and you share the gospel, you share a sandwich or a cup of water or something else, and in return, they wanted to find out who Jesus was, they learned more, they gave their life, and then they show up in heaven. You see them? That's the joy that never goes away, right? This is me just tying all this together. Yeah. But I mentioned that because in that short little passage in John 6, Jesus doesn't tie it together. He, he, he talks, like you said, he talks about things, but he doesn't really tell you how to work for eternal food. He just says, the father will give that to you. He will give the food to you. And I think it means he's going to bring people into your life. That's one way of looking at it. So it is. Well, and that's, I like that, Eddie, though. So that could be a tool that you employ in your nonfiction writing. You could you throw something out there and then you could ask perceptive questions that then the reader has to sit and contemplate and consider right. that could be a tool but it would have to be a consistent tool throughout the format of the nonfiction book and in fiction that reminds me of the movie clue and when it came out they offered three endings did you ever see that version no. of clue uh -huh where they offer you three endings and you could pick whichever ending you like. And they all actually were plausible. You know, they could have happened. It could have, the story could have resolved itself three different ways. It's, it was very, very interesting. That would, I'll, um, have to go, I'll have to get a look at that because that would blow my mind. To me, to me there's, <laughs> only, there's, there's only one answer for everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually not the one I have. Yeah. So, yeah. so pointing at the reader, you using the word you, you, you. Talk about that one a little bit. Oh, in nonfiction writing, um, when you, when the writer continually uses you instead of we and us, it kind of puts the the reader on a pushback. Maybe it's just me, but I push back when people start pointing the finger at me like I'm the problem I'm the one only one with the problem and and that could just be because of past experiences I've been through when somebody did point the finger at me and blame me for everything but the point is it it you don't want to do that you don't want to set yourself up that you are the instructor the lecturer and they are the receiver. You want to have a conversation, and a conversation never happens when we're pointing the finger yeah. at someone. Now, I'm with you. That's that's one of the things when I'm working through manuscripts on nonfiction. I right away just start changing the pronouns from to, from from you to we, us to our, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and all that. And because um, you're right, if if it's only you that I'm talking to, then I've got a very limited audience. I've got, I've got a reader of one for this whole book that I wrote. I've only got this one reader. But if we say we, then it's everybody. You know, right. that's a huge audience. Now I, I can sell my books to more people doing that. Way. And it seems like a, 
it seems like a subtle change, but it's a huge change that'll change it the is. tone of your book and it'll change the, the, the number of units that are sold for your book. Um, you can just stop pointing the writer to you. Well, and, and when we are in a friendly conversation, Eddie, I, I will lower my defenses and I will lean in and listen. But when you put me on the defense right away, like you're flawed, you have a problem, my defenses go up. Like I said, all of us have been through circumstances that we, we are carefully walking through life today. We, we're you know, constantly scanning because different affronts are coming to us from so many unsuspecting uh, places these days that our guard is up all the time. So if you really want to help someone, if you really want to teach them something that you feel would give them a better quality of life, having a conversation with them is the way to do it, not through lecture. All right, all right. <clears throat> so telling them, there's number seven is telling them there's only one way to feel or respond. Now, again, we're probably talking about nonfiction in this case. Explain that one a little bit. Well, I'm learning this as I go. I had, it's like before I had a child, I had such a strong opinion about parenting. And then I became a parent. And all of a sudden it's like, I, I was like, Schultz, I know nothing. I know nothing as I ought to know it. I realized, oh, you know, what I had to learn. So I think, um, say the question again. Well, so we're talking about there's that we, we in the manuscript in the book itself we are projecting the the concept that there's only one way to respond. To right. And, and right. So what I'm saying is your reader, um, for instance, cancer, dealing with cancer. There are so many ways to deal with cancer. So for you to just say there's only one way holistically and. And you need to take these herbs and these vitamins. And this is the only way you're going to beat your cancer. And another person says, you're going to pray. And prayer alone is going to help you beat this cancer. And then, you know, another book comes in and says, you've got to do the chemo and radiation. Do, do the drastic, save your life, you know. But what about a book that had stories of people that did all these different ways? of dealing with one problem and you read their particular stories and then Holy Spirit can speak to your heart and say, I'd like you to try, go this way, down this path. Um, and you're free to choose that path of treatment for your cancer because you're an individual and the Holy Spirit knows what is going to help you best so that's a big way of looking at it but is I hope that gives a little kind of peek about what I mean now I'm not yeah. talking about absolute truth we need absolutes but Chesterton yeah. said my my one of my favorite life quotes is you know within orthodox Christianity there's a great place for us to run wild, right. which means we can be ourselves, our unique selves within or Orthodox Christianity and have a lot of fun being us individually in and amongst the boundaries of Orthodox Christianity. We don't have to be a cookie cutter Christian, wear our hair the same way, dress the same way, or be the same way. So that's kind of where I'm going with that. Yeah, I was going to say that even, even going so far as to say there's only one way to believe. Mm -hmm. There's not just one way to believe. <laughs> I can write a book and go, there are multiple ways to believe. In fact, people believe multiple ways every day. So if you want to believe something completely different than what's in scripture, you're welcome to believe that. That is your right. That is, yes. That is, and I'm not going to tell you you can't believe that. I can't tell you that you don't believe you are the way you are. That's not for me to say. You believe the way right. you believe. I believe the way I believe. We each have the freedom to do that. I can give you guidance and instruction on what happens with those beliefs. 
I've got my beliefs this way. And I, and I tell people all the time, if I'm completely wrong about Jesus Christ, worst case scenario, I've helped some people, uh, perhaps encouraged some people. And when I die, I'll be turned into warm food. Worst case scenario. That's the worst case scenario. You know, and I've missed out on some good ways because maybe I should, you know, wasn't selfish enough to go start when I, you know, because I was doing something else. That's worst case. Best case, the payoff is there. That's that's my belief system. So yeah, even even coming down on something hard about belief, I think it's better to actually encourage people to believe what they want to believe and give them the truth and let them decide for themselves. Yeah. So, so that's so that's in the that's in the nonfiction realm. Um, and kind of that same does that same concept does apply a little bit in, in fiction, because when you come at your your novel with such a heavy agenda, mm -hmm. you're kind of projecting that same thing. That there's only one way to believe something, right? So if you're all about global warming or, or rising tides or um, abortion, even for example, on the opposite end of something, right? If you come at it really hard on the novel side, then you're kind of leaving the reader with the concept, whoa. If I don't believe like the, the author, I, I, I'm, I'm wrong. Um, and rather than projecting that, just show the consequences of everything and let them determine which is the best route to go. Um, so the other, the next one is um, lecturing, which I think is probably in the same one. We're probably, we're we'll probably covered that about the same time, talking about how you believe. Um, how about connecting the tragic event to the story's outcome? The connecting the tragic event to the story the outcome. You could take that if you'd like, or. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, for me, it's um, that's that's the, the that's the tying up of the loose ends at the end of a novel. So you can have the complete story with the climax at the end. And, and, and I'll, I, again, I'll come back to the crucifixion because uh, that's a good example for a lot of our viewing audience. You can relate to that. So if you. If you stop the story of the life of Jesus at the cross after at his death, that's the climax, right? right. It, it, was, it was a win or lose, and he's dead. That's what we're left with. He's dead, you know, and everybody scatters. If you end the story there, uh, you're left, the reader is left with a lot of questions and not a lot of answers and probably not a lot of hope, right? Right. But you've got to tie up that tragic event to the story's outcome and make it mean something, right? Right. And of course, the meaning is that three days later, they go to look for his body and can't find it in the tomb. And that never happens, right? So they still don't necessarily have all the answers, but at least they've got a question now that's left them perplexed a little bit more. And even if you st stop the story there with the women and Peter and John coming that morning and looking in and there's nobody and the angels are there saying, he's not here. Mm -hmm. he, he left. Well, who stole him? He, nobody stole him. He rose and left. Even if you stop the story there, at least you've stopped the story at a place where the reader can go, hmm, I'm going to have to go back and read everything he said <laughs> and try to make meaning of this, right? So that's a, that's a way of ending that story. Um, so that last chapter in novel, the tying up the loose ends, it's key. It's very important because it tells the reader in some ways, how they should how they should feel, what they should think, what should they take away from the story, kind of leaves them with some of the theme thematic answers to the story itself. It's kind of why you spend all this time writing the story. That's what the tying up of the loose ends is supposed to do. So, Diana, do you have any parting comments or thoughts before we wrap up today's episode? Well, I just wanted to say my final comment about that last point is that in nonfiction. We, um, in memoir, they will tell all the ugly they've lived through. So the event, they show the tragic event, but they don't spend enough time on the redemption part of their story. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage people that are telling personal uh, stories that they are equally if not heavier on the redemptive side because um often it's a little bit too graphic to take people there and not unnecessary because again people have lived enough they know enough 
Um, so you can touch lightly on things and we can use our imagination to imagine the horror of it. And also again, watch out for those repeating uh, stories within personal stories, belaboring the abuse, belaboring uh, and saying it over and over again. Yeah, that, that's we, got it. It. we heard it, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because that's how we that's how we completed uh, wrapped up last night's Bible study. After in John six, we just I stopped at the part where there's a phrase where he says that he he told him stop grumbling. Jesus says stop grumbling, right? Okay. And that's I kind of stopped there and I was like, here's the problem with grumbling. If you're grumbling, complaining, um, pointing out the the faults and the flaws in other people, if you're doing all that, you're you're basically seeding you're building bitter soil mm. and expecting blessings to come from the bitter soil that you're just, you know, you're putting salt and vinegar and everything else you can on the dirt. And then you're expecting good things to grow from it, you know, and Jesus says, stop grumbling, uh, you know, and I told him, I said, when I was at IBM, we had, there was a, a, a truism for IBM. There was a, you could not do this if you were in a meeting, which is if you brought a problem to the table, which we were encouraged to do, you know, you want people to, point out the flaws, bring a problem out. But if you bring a problem, you better bring a solution. If you don't have a solution, you don't bring the problem. And your solution may not be the one we use, but you at least ought to have put enough thought into it to be able to find a way to fix it. Same thing yeah. with, same thing with, you know, the, the, the memoir that doesn't bring the redemption. If you're going to do this, you better bring the redemption to the end of it. You better bring right. that because otherwise you're just leaving people with, well, that, I don't feel good about this. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. I, I talk, you know, when my son was little, we had Mr. Yuck stickers to put on all the things under the kitchen sink, yes. you know, and when he saw the Mr. Yuck sticker, he knew those were hands off right. and and, and uh, would not be good for him. And I think of it in, in a lot of personal memoirs, I think, ooh, let's just put a Mr. Yuck sticker <laughs> here. <laughs> you know, uh, TMI, too much information. It right. isn't it isn't necessary. Right. So all right. Well, this has been great. Diana, we will uh pick up with the next week with another episode of Reality Coaching for Writers. Nothing but the real stuff, no fluff. Thanks for being with us this week. See you then. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.